podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Author Steve Barry's new book looks at the possibility that pirates helped with the Revolutionary War. Mr. Barry recently sat down with North Carolina Book Watch host D.G. Martin to talk about the Jefferson Key. We've got a, a brand new, what is going to be a best-selling book, The Jefferson Key. I hope and, so. <laughs> and it's set back here in North Carolina, lots of it down in Bath. And mm -hmm. you, you, uh, you know something about Bath, don't you? I do. I've been coming here since I was a child. My mother was born in Wilson. My aunts and uncles and cousins still live over in Greenville. So I came up here at least twice a year for many, many years. And I went to Bath a lot because we went over to Bayview. And so when I was plotting this American thriller, I said, going to put some pirates in it, got to put Bath in it. Well, that's great. Well, we're talking about pirates, you know, movies about pirates. Uh, they're finding Blackbeard's anchor and mm -hmm. trying to bring up his anchor and his cannon. So, and then, as you know, from your time in North Carolina, we're always interested in pirates. Mm -hmm. But you teach us in this book um, where pirates are an important part of it, the difference between pirates and privateers and the different roles that they played mm -hmm. in our history. Can yeah. you give us a little quick history lesson? Privateers were very important to the American Revolution. They helped win it. They helped bring the English merchants to their knees. They helped force King George to end the war by ravaging the British shipping. They work with a letter of mark. They have an, a, a, an authorization from a government to go out and ravage our enemies. Pirates do not have a letter of mark. And that's the difference between the two. Now, again, with privateers, they usually violate that letter and usually cross the line and usually do it. If, and then once you cross the line, you become a pirate. Well, did we have both uh, pirates and privateers in North Carolina in the early days? You would have had both, yes. What happened was uh, privateers are basically the nursery of pirates. That was said in a, in a famous book written back in the 18th century. And there was a lot of privateers that lived in the Bath area there. And a lot of pirates who retired from pirating and became privateers, supposedly, to do. Yes, that was sort so it of... So worked both. There was in and out both ways. They go, what about Blackbeard? He was uh, both. He went in and out too. So he, he had, at some points, he had governmental authority to attack enemy shipping. He was very close with the governor of North Carolina. That's how he got his little uh, his pardon, so he could actually hang out and live there. Fortunately, the governor of Virginia didn't like that too much and sent, it, sent some folks down here to get him. So yes, they were very uh, pirates were very smart. These were not uh, dumb so the, people. The, the, that was the first invasion of from Virginia into a uh, military invasion. They came down it was here. Sort of like the swoop. The uh, Bin Laden swoop. They just they came swooped, down and. That's exactly got what him. they did. They swooped into the, the Pamlico River and snuck in and had at it. Had a battle down there and eventually um, won it. And, I, and that's in the book. I had to put it in the book. I, had to, I couldn't let that go. It was too cool. Well, the, uh, we're looking forward to reading the Jefferson Key set in North Carolina a lot. And uh, those people who read it will learn a lot about pirates and mm -hmm. pirating. Uh, was, uh, we, we think of uh, the Outer Banks and Bath uh, as centers of pirating are we is that myth or is that oh no factual? no that's exactly if you were gonna if you were looking for a pirate or a privateer in the mid 18th century that's the place to go uh, you basically had Nova Scotia to the north Bath here in North Carolina and Jamaica down in the south so uh, this was like these were pirate central this is where they hung out so no it's a it was a it was an industry there was a big shipbuilding industry in Bath and of course pirates and privateers need that and so it was perfect for them plus the Pamlico is great too because it's very shallow and it's got a lot of sandbars and a lot lot of treachery in there. In fact, it's called one of the most treacherous waterways on the planet. So you got to know your way around. They knew their way around. So it offered them some great protection to be up in that river. Protection and also danger in the sense that, um, like when Blackbeard was he, captured, it, he, he it, ran aground. It was I a two-edged sword. Yes, it was. Now, what about the local people who lived in just the ordinary people in Bath mm -hmm. during those times? Or were there any ordinary people? Oh, yeah, or was sure. everybody just uh, uh, supporting oh, no, no, or no. in on the no, there was, a, there was a whole support industry. I mean, those ships had to be supplied. Uh, you had uh, farmers producing produce. You had uh, sh stores. You had shipbuilding. You had all the things you needed. And, it was, and Bath was the provincial capital, too. So it was a very busy place. How did these North Carolina pirates differ from the pirates in Somalia today? Very much is different. Uh, pirates, pirates from what we see on Hollywood are not what... They were like, they were not like that at all. And I didn't know this either until I started doing the research in this book. Pirate society was governed by very strict rules. They were very smart. They were not, they were not just haphazard. They were one of the first democracies. Everything worked in a de democratic method there. It was, it was a set guidelines and set ways of doing things, and they adhered to those rules. If they did not, it would have been utter chaos. 
So they had rules, and it's very interesting to me, and I learned all of that, and in the book you're going to learn about that too, that you know, real pirates were very different than Hollywood pirates. So uh, I'm perked up when you said democracy. Pirates were a democracy? Sure. Uh, for example, on a pirate ship, the captain was elected. It wasn't. You don't think, I mean, we, that's not our image. Our image is this uh, autocratic uh, person. Captain who, was elected, and if you didn't like, if they didn't like the captain, they unelected him. And when they unelected him, they let him off on the nearest piece of land and sailed off. And so was the, what about the ownership of the ship, the pirate ship? Did the captain not own the ship, or it was owned ship by? ship could have been owned by no telling who would have owned the ship. Ships, and most of the time the ships were stolen. They weren't really owned by anybody. They would just steal a ship and move on to the other. And that captain would have control of that vessel, and he would, this would be a ship. But he could be deposed in a heartbeat set off on the next piece of land, and the new guy takes over and takes the ship and goes on with it. And it was very much democratic in that way because you had to be careful how you treated your crew. Well, once the, once the captain's elected, mm -hmm. no democracy then, he's, a, he's he an can, autocrat. He can give he's, his orders. Yes, he can. So and, he's subject to being deposed, but while he's in office, he's got full power. Well, no, while he's in office, he's got power, and he can be deposed at any time except during battle. During battle, no vote could be taken. But if you're not in battle, you're just sailing around, and the ship crew got together and said, we're taking him out, they could vote him out, and that's the end of it. And that's how it was done. It was very interesting. I didn't realize that either. That, that's how it worked. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV.